may surprise you, but the capital of Scotland, Edinburgh, is not the largest city in Scotland. That honour belongs to its westerly neighbour, Glasgow. The land that the city sits on has had human activity for millennia, thanks to its proximity to the River Clyde. Like most rivers, the Clyde provided the people living around it with food and water. The river naturally got wider as it meandered to the coast and out to sea. Glasgow has always been important and was a religious hub for many years. Its wealth and status was elevated when a university was created, but by the early 1800s, overseas and local trade was exploding in the UK and the river provided the perfect place for traders to set up a large port. Glasgow suddenly exploded into an international industrious hub in a matter of years. To help the ports support the traders, the river was dredged and widened to make way for bigger ships. It was the largest port in Scotland and the 10th largest in the country. Almost everything passed through the docks, from linen to tobacco. It was no surprise that the city was known as the second city of the British Empire. It's also no surprise that Glasgow was in prime position to accept the advancements of the Industrial Revolution. As the city grew, so did the number of people coming in looking for work. And by the mid-1800s, the city's urban sprawl had grown to the point that the populace were clamouring for better transport links. The people of Glasgow had a few simple demands. It had to be cheap, it had to be quick, and most importantly, it had to be accessible. Glasgow was not without railways. By the 1850s, it had four passenger terminals and a multitude of lines owned by various companies that were great bringing people in from smaller towns and suburbs. But the lines were able to intersect or connect. And while the Clyde was the lifeblood of the city and its most valuable resource, it cut the city practically in half with the neighbours, with the residents and the dockyards on the southern bank and the commercial businesses on the northern. What was needed was a way to link all these together, but overground was impossible. There were too many buildings and a river in the way. So taking a leaf out of London's book, the only option was to look below the surface. The civil engineer Alexander Simpson was given the task to design the subway. He was employed by the Glasgow District Subway, the main company behind the scheme. At first he planned for a single tunnel around three miles long, housing a double track, but the plan didn't get past the House of Commons, so Alexander went back to the planning board. When he came back a few years later, the scheme was more elaborate. There would be now two tunnels built, the north and the south sides of the pier would be connected, and there would be more districts able to utilise it. Parliament loved it, the people loved it, but the Clyde Trust didn't. The Clyde Trust was the firm responsible for the care of the river. They objected to the plan. If the railway went ahead putting two lots of double tunnels under the Clyde, then it was felt that this would severely hamper any widening and dredging of the river. Their petition was successful, and for the second time, Alexander's plans were shot down. That was until the Glasgow Harbour Tunnel Company had announced they'd been granted permission to build a tunnel for pedestrians under the Clyde's Trust nose. Simpson went back to the courts, armed with this vital news, and proving his point that the tunnel had created a right-of-way, so to speak, the subway scheme was revived, and it was third-time lucky as Simpson and the Glasgow District Subway Company got the green light. Again, taking a leaf from the London Underground's book, the plan was to use cut and cover method where possible and use tunnelling shield method where the cut and cover method wasn't practical. The plan was to connect the line in one giant loop around the city, with trains travelling in opposing directions in their own dedicated tunnel. Unlike Simpson's original idea, running trains independently had great benefit. If anything went wrong, then the other train could continue running. When it came to the river, the workers would use built-up air pressure. It cut through the bed well. However, there was a few mishaps, including a few times where the riverbed had a tendency to explode. The railway was completed in 1896, and it was nothing like anyone had seen on an underground line. For starters, it didn't conform to standard gauge. The gauge for this railway is only four foot. The tunnels were smaller too, standing in at only 11 foot. This left little clearance, even narrower than the narrow underground lines. 
rolling stock for this line would have to be bespoke. Secondly was the power. The company had the choice of any motive power that they wished. Simpson rolled out steam very quickly. They want enough ventilation and the steam engine smoke would cause the people to choke. But in a move that would oppose some, he ruled out electricity too. The electric engines were still too large for the little line and it was feared that the engines would not be able to navigate some of the steeper gradients within the tunnels that are presenting themselves during construction. Instead, he resorted to cable power. The job of putting in the cable fell to a man called David Morton. He had recommended the use of cable traction and advised the company of its benefits. David was employed as a civil engineer to the project and given the matter a great deal of study and went to America to see how their cabling networks worked. Through this research, he was able to invent the giant machines that would haul the railway. The engines were bespoke and perfectly adapted to run the line. David himself oversaw every aspect of his machines, even after they came into operation. The passenger coaches that would run on the line were built at Dalbury Garage and Wagon Company. The interiors would be spacious and comfortable for the passengers, and the front and rear of the coach there would be a small vestibule for the driver and the guard. Passengers were only permitted to enter from the back door, while those wishing to exit the coach had to leave from the front. As the guard was at the back, he could easily oversee the passengers board safely while the driver can watch them depart. And once all the doors were secure, the guard can signal to go by electric bell. As with the London and Blackhall Railway, the cable powering the engines never stopped. Instead, all the time stationary or moving, the cable travels through a device mounted to the coach called a gripper. The gripper would be found near the front bogey of the coach and sat several inches above the railhead. Between the cable and the gripper, there are two clamping claws in the upper claw can be lowered and raised using a steering wheel in the cab and has a safety mechanism so should anything go wrong and the cable needed to be released, it could be thrown clear. There were 15 stations built on the little network and it opened to the public in 1897. The railway had a rocky start on its opening day where a signalling failed and the carriage crashed into another, injuring four people. But the railway improved and tried again in, on the 19th of January. It was originally planned that the passengers paid a flat fare of a penny to travel. This was implemented and quickly abandoned as cheeky kids or adults were just wanting to be annoying paid the fare then travelled around and round in circles all day. The engine house worked perfectly and was sited on the south side of the river. There were two engines. Each were planned to be dedicated to its own tunnel. However, it was found that these engines were so efficient and powerful that only one was needed to run the entire network. Therefore, one was kept in reserve and the twin engines alternated between each other every other week or so. Finally, to ensure the cable had the perfect amount of tension, a tension house was built with two special carriages called tension carriages. They ensured that the right amount of tension was put on the cable at any one time and could be adjusted by plate weights depending on the number of carriages, the time of day and even by the weather. Signalling was pretty straightforward too. They adopted block signalling and thanks to it being mostly automatic, signalman was a non-existent job on the railway. At each station there was a simple semaphore and a treadle on the line. As the train sets off from the station, it hits the treadle and the signal was set to danger. The line would only show clear when the last carriage has passed another treadle at the, at the end of the block. There was communications through telephone and bell signalling at every station and everybody was able to contact the power station to stop the engines if the need arises. The railway remained unchanged until 1923 when the Glasgow corporations took over the running of the line. By then more powerful electric engines had been built and which would be able to take on the gradients the underground line had and the engines were much smaller and sleeker than ever before. It felt right to retire the antiquated cable railway and replace it with electric. Work started straight away and once complete, for the first time in two decades, on the 30th of November 1935, the Great Power Station fell silent and a third rail would take on the demands of supplying power to the train. 
The only thing the company did not decide to update was the electric pickup for the lighting in the carriages. To light the carriage there was a rail connection mounted to the wall on the non-platform side of the train and the train would pick up the power from that instead. This wasn't touched until the 70s. During the war, very much like the London Underground, the line would prove vital for the war effort. As the stations were built nearer to the surface as they could, the line would make a poor shelter. But it did ferry more people than ever before to the docks and shipyards. It survived well and only suffered one indirect hit which closed part of the system for around about four months. But despite the loss of two mainline stations near to the underground, thanks to beaching, the line was being run pretty much the same as it did the day it were opened. In fact, some of the rolling stock that opened the line were still running in the 70s, only with a few cosmetic improvements inside and of course the electric pickup. This was good 80 years ago, but the stations were getting really worn and run down. The carriages were old and falling apart, and the passengers were complaining of a lingering damp stink all around the line. The trains kept breaking down, and because there's no points to get them off the tracks, delays were rife. But it all came to a head on the 24th of March 1977, when cracks started to appear in the roof of Govan Cross Station. Something had to be done, and fast. In a first since it was opened, the Glasgow Passenger Transport Executive, who had taken over from the Glasgow Corporation, ordered a complete shutdown of the entire network. Everything would be modernised. Platforms extended, trains removed and updated, a new state-of-the-art system was brought in, and every tunnel was checked and repaired if needed. Finally, the whole ring would get new, heavy-duty track. It would be a massive undertaking, and scores of people worked day and night to get the project done. Buses would take on the routes of the underground, and it took over three years to complete. But after a formal ceremony in 1979, the line opened to passengers again in 1980. It was clean, simple, and everything was automatic. Even the trains drove themselves. The Glasgow subway system has been in place for over 125 years, and in that time the route and the line has never changed. It's never been expanded upon but that might be about to change. As the cities grow, its demands on the subway increases. And in 2005, plans were put forward for a second line near to the west of the city. As it's gone through various planning and studies, and it's on the cards, it's in its awkward yes, no phase at the moment, with councillors weighing in on its viability versus cost. The underground has been affectionately dubbed the Clockwork Orange, and it's the only underground line I know of that has a sub crawl. 15 stations, 15 pubs. And it's just updating its rolling stock again as we speak. But whichever way you look at it, the Glasgow City Underground is certainly a unique system indeed.